table. And now the official live stream welcome. So give me a quick second. Good afternoon, I'm Steve Gregorian, President and CEO of the Detroit Economic Club. An exciting day here at the DEC. It's our annual Career Readiness Academy graduation day, so welcome to today's meeting. To get us started, let me introduce our presiding officer. Angie Kelly is the office managing partner of EY. She's a DEC board member, a great friend to the DEC and to me personally, and also an enthusiastic supporter of many, many things in our state region and community. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Angie Kelly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Steve, and good afternoon, DEC members and guests. It's my pleasure to introduce our panelists today. Uh, first, Rob Riney is the president of, and CEO of Henry Ford Health. He has over 40 years of experience at Henry Ford, where he has worked in almost every business unit in the system. Bob is a graduate of Wayne State University. <laughs> Next is Ray Scott. Ray is the president and CEO of Lear Corporation and began his career with Lear in 1988. Ray holds a degree in economics from U of M and an MBA from Michigan State University. He also attended executive education programs at Stanford University and the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Ray. and Dr. Tarek Chobe. In his, it's in his second year as president of Lawrence Technological University, Dr. Chobe is a licensed professional engineer, a noted scholar, and author. He received a degree in engineering with honors in computer science and automatic control from Alexandria University in Egypt, and he has a master's and, and PhD in computer and information science from the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome, Dr. Chobe. Thank you, Angie, and, and welcome to you three. Um, we have to make note, we're in Ford Field, home of our Detroit Lions, and all indications are we're gonna be opening up against the Kansas City Chiefs, I read, opening day. How are we feeling about the upcoming season, guys? Let's go, let's go to the defending right, champs. I like it. Let's go to their home field, and let's, <laughs> <laughs> go Lions. I think we all have high hopes this year, don't we? We're proud. I've been drinking the Kool-Aid for a while. <laughs> <laughs> we all drink that Kool-Aid, and uh, we're proud to be the team's physicians, and so we're going to keep them healthy, and I think they're going to have a great year. Jeremy. I was just appointed president. This is the year that good things are going to happen. You know, I love so. it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so today, guys, it's another in our Future of Work series, as I mentioned. This one's focused on technology. We prepped in advance, and we're going to cover automation, uh, the future workforce and AI, and then we're gonna weave in what does higher ed need to do to prepare us for all of that. So I wanna start with some fun stuff though. I get really geeked when I see some really cool technology. I love that stuff. I'm just gonna ask each of you, maybe starting with Bob, one piece of technology we'll find in your company <coughs> that you see the like, oh, that is so cool. That is so awesome. So, you know, I was going to answer that with uh, some of the most advanced robotics that we have in our surgical centers because those are incredibly cool and they reduce length of stay. They really are consistent and reduce, reduction of any kind of side effects, et cetera. But I want to give examples that really make an immediate difference to patients and especially some of our most vulnerable or underserved patients. And so I'll give you an example. We have a program called Heart Healthy Moms, and this is designed to get at both pre and postpartum moms that have cardiovascular disease that often ends up with very poor outcome for the baby and very poor outcome for the mom themselves. And we now have a diagnostic tool that can early identify and then that device goes home with those moms and it gives us immediate connection and reading into when things are starting to 
uh, become problematic. It also allows us to immediately understand whether they have transportation barriers or anything to kind of get the care and the service that they need. And it's making such a profound difference in terms of re reduction of readmissions, reduction of low birth weight babies, um, uh, babies that die in process of delivery, as well as moms. And so, you know, when you can have small devices that interact in a home that get 50% reduction, really in our most vulnerable populations, that's what makes us and fuels our energy. And one other exciting real quick um, uh, one in the series of wearables is we all know that mental health is a really significant challenge. And part of the mental health challenge is my, uh, adherence to pharmaceutical um, uh, practices and expectations. And so, you know, we're piloting now wearables that are specifically designed for different mental illness where a caregiver at certain intervals can listen into the patient. They can tell by the speed of their voice, the change in a, a, a f affection, the change in demeanor as to whether or not they are adhering with the medicine or not. And then they can make an immediate intervention, immediate reach out. So those things are really at the end of the day making a huge impact on people's lives and the families that they have to serve, uh, that have to support them, excuse me. So those are the things that excite me. Yeah, very cool. How about you, Ray? Well, um, there's so much technology innovation that's out there right now. It's absolutely amazing. But, you know, we are the best uh, seat manufacturers and we supply the best products in uh, electronics uh, for EVs and autonomous vehicles and those type of things. But, you know, the thing that I get excited about across the board is our product uh, in, in uh, seating. We have uh, developed, by the way, we do supply seats to every major OEM. And if you like your seat, we make it. If you don't like it, it's our competitors, and they need to improve. So, and one thing that we need to improve, we're all customers. What's great about my job is, yeah, we produce parts for um, our, our, our customers, our OEMs, but we're also customers ourselves. So why isn't the seat smart? Why isn't it intuitive? Why isn't it just adjust to my anthropometric measurements and adjust for comfort? Because we all change over time and, and throughout the day, and, and why isn't it just programmed in a way that it adjusts the temperatures within the vehicle for my comfort level, regardless if it's a beautiful 80 degrees outside or if it's 20 degrees outside. Well, that's what we develop. That's what we're developing today. It reads your um, heart rate. It'll tell if you're drowsy. It'll adjust your seat, your personal preferences. So when you get in the seat, if you're slouching, it'll help adjust your spine. It'll drive comfort. You know, the technology that's going in the seat is absolutely amazing. And we have Hopefully we'll be able to announce some development contracts soon with OEs that are getting this product out to the customer because the seat, I mean, it, you think of a seat as foam and trim and, you know, frames and, you know, hasn't changed forever, but the seat is becoming a smart device connected to your smart device and really getting the customers like us the, the desired uh, features that we're looking for. Cool. Tarek, you've got your accelerator too, I know. That's true. I, yeah. the, the kind of amazing advances happening in technology in Lawrence Tech really center around the areas of artificial intelligence and also autonomous robotics. So we're doing really cool stuff within our different colleges, whether that's engineering, computer science, or, or the other ones. And the nice feature in Lawrence Tech is that the R&D, the basic R&D that we do in the college to develop these new patents and ideas through funded research then migrates to the accelerator where actually startup businesses are being formed to develop them. So I'll give a few examples of really cool things <laughs> happening on campus. We're working a lot on autonomous navigation and autonomous gizmos. Uh, we're, we're currently actually developing an automatic autonomous snow blower that can actually go and continue to do snow blowing on the streets uh, using a whole bunch of sensors from infrared to x-ray to laser range finders to cameras and actually can be used in very large areas. That has mi migrated from the point of being uh, a patent and now actually it is being manufactured and we have the first commercial version on campus of that autonomous robotics snow blower. Lots of work on AI in all the fields varying from architecture, uh, automatically generating using generative AI models for buildings, all the way to generative AI, creating and designing art, 
Uh, we're also doing lots of work within the medical field in particular in diagnosis, uh, uh, basically recognition and diagnosis of diseases and symptoms in x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs, EEGs, and EKGs. And uh, with actually an incredible success rate, uh, lots of R&D in, in that area and in the area of computer vision in general. Uh, again, the, the coupling of autonomy in various applications and artificial intelligence and machine learning and I know we'll probably talk about this later, is basically launching completely new job titles and completely new products. Uh, we're basically teaching students and uh, for job titles that don't even exist yet. So the uh, future is kind of really interesting. So. Good. Ray, let's talk about um, why companies automate. Pretty simplistic just to say it's a way to reduce a workforce it's a way to cut costs. There's way more complication there, isn't it? Yeah, and I think it's been accelerated uh, post-COVID. And you know, when we first started our journey in Industry 4.0, and thinking through data analytics and, and automation and cobots, and you know, the manufacturing plant lights out those type of concepts, it, it would truly was about, in our mind, about being more preventative and predictive. And, and our CFO is sitting here, right here, and a lot of those decisions that we're making to really protect on safety items or quality didn't have a very good IRR. The returns weren't there. And, but you know, from a, a manufacturing perspective, it's all about your reputation and delivering a high quality product that delivers time and time again, over and over again. So those consistencies and those you know, automations and technologies that allow us to drive the manufacturing efficiencies really, really were a, pr a priority for us. What, has evolved now, and I think you think about automation, you think about the social aspects of what do you do with all these people? You know, how do you redirect, how do you retrain, those type of things, but there's a fundamental problem that has occurred, in, or at least recognizing um, there's, a, there's an issue in the manufacturing world. There's 500,000 unoccupied manufacturing jobs today in the United States. Uh, population growth rate is declining significantly in certain regions in Europe, in China, in the United States, and the manufacturing population is increasing. In addition to that, the attractiveness for manufacturing jobs has declined because you have a lot more options. Where if you want to be an Uber driver and, and, and also work at Amazon, you have flexibility where you can change your shifts. The, the attractiveness of going into a, a nine to five work six, seven days a week is really on the decline. And so to us, it was really about not the social aspects, but the survival aspects. If we don't change, we won't be in business. And so we've really put a path forward, and there is no finish line. That's one thing I've realized, that every part of our process is we, uh, we manufacture electronics, we manufacture wiring, trim covers, just-in-time seating, all around the world. And each one of those different manufacturing facilities have different priorities and needs. And so we're really working on each one of those different processes to really improve. And, and I think it's, it's, it's more, this technology is great, but it's used in different ways with different purposes. And right now it's about, the team hears me say it all the time, we won't be around in 2025 if we don't find better ways to automate within our manufacturing plants and get efficiency and productivity out of our plants. So where is that headed? I know you've got some automation going on today. Where are you headed with that? Well, okay, so the, the, if you, Look at the ultimate goal is these uh, dark out facilities or blacked out facilities. Um, it depends on the manufacturing process that you're running. You know, there's absolutely a requirement to have, you know, uh, employees within the facility, but it isn't a target. We, we talk about it all the time, it isn't a target that we have to reduce 20,000 heads. It's more about protecting for quality, gaining the productivity in the plant, and then making sure we can run the, the business in 2025 and beyond. I want to read you a statement about talent and workforce that will set the context for the next part of our conversation. The global economic impact of technology is increasingly being considered by commentators, but in widely different ways. One view is it will bring less work, make workers redundant, or end work by replacing workers. That's a pretty pessimistic view, optimistic view. 
technology will create abundant opportunities for workers and boost economies. And historically, we have found that as technology has changed the way work is done, the number of jobs created has outpaced the number of jobs eliminated. So, Tarek, I'll come to you. I've heard you talk before about this. You're really, you have a really good handle on emerging paradigms, innovations in areas like AI, robotics, automation, analytics, and how that will impact the future of work. Talk about well, that. Well, I'm, I'm personally incredibly optimistic. Uh, artificial intelligence is not going to replace a worker. What's going to replace a worker is another worker who knows how to use artificial intelligence. Uh, so at the end of the day, I, I think tools that basically that exist already, and I'm not only talking about things like ChatGPT and similar AI tools, I'm talking about the whole idea of machine learning and, and, and artificial intelligence and autonomy using humongous large sets of data is gonna make what we do much more efficient, precise, concise, and comprehensive. Whether it's in the area of, of autonomous robotic surgery at some point using Da Vinci platforms, whether it's in the area of industry 4.0, whether it's in the area of designing automated platforms, or for that matter, even designing and building buildings uh, completely autonomously using uh, artificial intelligence-driven autonomous machinery. Uh, AI and, and all of these emerging machine deep learning paradigms is the new calculator. Uh, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, teachers were not, you know, very happy with you know, students using calculators in the class. AI tools is the new calculator. It makes, you know, life more efficient, more conducive to productivity. Uh, interdisciplinarity is the key. Uh, thresholds between disciplines are very fast disappearing in areas like robotic surgery, automatic construction of buildings, data analytics, et cetera. Uh, so we need well cross-trained professionals who need, to, who need to know the usage of these tools and be comfortable with change and working across different disciplines. Perfect, thank you. Let's go to uh, Bob. You're building your academic destination campus, west side of your hospital on Grand uh, Boulevard. Can you talk about the effects of the new technology that he's talking about in training your workforce in the future? Sure, and I, I wanna just quickly talk about the last question, because I think we have to be honest with everybody. The answer is both and, it's not an either or. Automation is going to eliminate jobs, and I don't think that you know we should shy away from that, but and, it's gonna create new jobs and new opportunities. And I think for all of us, the challenge is how do we bridge that gap between the skills of those that have roles that automation will eliminate with the skills needed for the new roles. There are going to be plenty of opportunities. And that's the approach we're taking within Henry Ford Health as we embark on this major transformation. So, you know, we, are, we have a lot of patient transports and we have a lot of manual transports of supplies. We're looking for, in that new hospital, for that to be all autonomous mm -hmm. and to be all self-directed that doesn't require that physical labor of those individuals, especially on the supply side. You know, we're looking at how we can have remote monitoring of patients so that you can actually have 24-7 real-time monitoring, but through a centralized technology-driven uh, place. It does not change that the most important thing in healthcare is high touch and that this is a very human business, but it actually will free up the nurses and the doctors to spend the time in conversations with the patient and the family about their goals, about their needs, about the options for care versus being so focused on the mechanics, on the record keeping. And so, you know, I envision that this hospital will have AI that will actually do all the recording of the physician interactions with the patient so that the physician doesn't need to be focused on a computer uh, and typing in notes. They can actually just be engaging with the patient and it'll do that in a real time basis. Um, I also think that AI in this new um, hospital will help the physicians with the identification of rare diseases that may fall out of the normal review based on symptomatic 
uh, presentation. And that's, that's a challenge in healthcare because, you know, you look at the majority and so, you know, six symptoms means for most people this, but for, um, you know, certain parts of our population, it means something very different. AI allows you to plug that in at a, just an unbelievable, you know, kind of level and produce options based on that individual that might not otherwise have been thought about. Um, so we're, we're looking for a lot of automation. I, my goal is that no role that's in a hospital setting today will be the same in this facility when it opens. They'll all be different because of the infusion of this technology. Good, Ray, even in um, automotive industry, automation's not just limited to factory jobs. I know you've got tons of employees in your factories around the world, but it's not just limited to that, is it? No, not at all. I mean, we have 170,000 employees around the world, and you know, like I said, the acceleration post-COVID of how you can work differently. And we talk about, you know, uh, shared services, and 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 I and I've talked to the employees all the time too about having jobs that are 100% remote. Those jobs, in some respects, can be automated, and they are being automated, and and or being relocated to share services where you know, like our HR uh, departments where you're doing the onboarding become, you know, offshored into different regions. And so the way you think about um, the different jobs and the definitions of jobs has, has changed dramatically. And, and I think the enhancement of AI where you can now automate a lot of different, you know, manual processes that can be validated in your legal department or your HR group or even your finance group are starting to really change significantly how you think about the workload, and that's really what's going on now. And it, it, we talk about the, the human qualities and needs versus the machine learning or data analytics and how you can differentiate and define a job. And so, you know, that is changing, it's changing quickly. Um, and, and what we talk about is what jobs are required, uh, you know, when in, within a team setting, you know, where you're collaborating, innovative, uh, strategic versus more of a manual uh, type job that is uh, really, you know, going to these type of applications. Yep. Tarek, you've heard a little bit from both of them about how they're thinking about their future workforce. How does higher ed need to respond to make sure we're filling the jobs of, that they need? Well, uh, th th there are 6,000 universities in the US, uh, which is probably too many, but that's a different discussion. Uh, <laughs> That's not good for my career aspirations, <laughs> what, I just, what I just said, I think. But the bottom line is I think successful universities and institutions of higher learning are going to be the one that really emphasizes work skills, the kind of skills that particular employers need. Uh, the future of higher education is not necessarily going to be about the, the credential name or what the degree name is, business administration, electrical engineering, computer science. It's gonna be a collection of skill sets that enables the professional of the future to function within this incredibly highly automa automated uh, environment. Whether these skill sets are in coding, whether these skill sets are in the usage of artificial intelligence tools and machine learning and analytics and cloud computing tools efficiently, whether these are general professional skills, being just able to work in teams and being able to report out and work on things like budgets, et cetera. And again, the successful institutions of the future are the ones that are going to be very highly interdisciplinary in the way that they conduct their instruction, very technological, and ensure that the students within the various majors, not only engineering and technology, but every single major, come out very technologically savvy at the end of their journey uh, for four years or more in a particular degree program, and are professionally trained. What use, what a term I don't like is soft skills. I, I, I mean professional skills, being able to be professionals in the various environments. Uh, just summing up, uh, when it comes to automation in particular, and I know many people would not like what I'm going to say next, I believe the need for manual labor over the next 40, 50 years, probably much less, uh, is going to simply disappear. I don't think there will be a need for a job that requires real manual work. Uh, yeah, we will do things with our hand that are very important, including in healthcare and so on, but the need for a job to be completed by hand versus something else is simply gonna disappear, whether it's a driving or 
delivering or even the service industry, the kind of automation skills and the usage of automation modules and systems will need to be something that every professional studies regardless <laughs> of the discipline that she or he graduates from. That's a pretty big pivot for the 6,000 colleges. <laughs> what are the challenges that, yeah, what are the challenges that higher ed will face to, to make that pivot? Uh, it's all about the value proposition, I think. Uh, the value proposition of higher education since its inception has been student would go to a university, come out with the skills to make her or him employable after X number of years, and be able to make, hopefully, much more than a living wage, right? And be a productive professional. Uh, that premise, that value proposition, is being attacked by everyone, attacked questioned, I guess is the right term, by parents, by industry, by students, and to be very honestly, rightfully so. The percentage of universities and the percentage of graduates every year within the system, we have 16 million undergraduates in the country at, or studying undergraduate degrees. The percentage of these 16 million who number one makes it out and number two makes it out with the skills conducive to much more than a living wage salary and the right professional skills, I submit is not more than 10 to 15 percent of that number. And hence the dramatic shortage that my colleagues have been referring to in their presentations. Uh, universities need to teach the skills and ensure the outcomes at the end of the journey. And you're all hearing every week, you know, two, three universities closing, you know, in every state, let alone in the country. That was not the trend. Uh, and again, when you there are so many measures that we can talk about later, but when you take the population size in our country and the different you know, number of universities and what they do, there is something not, not working within the system. Got a few minutes left. I want to spend some time on AI, and there's tons and tons and tons of articles, columns, everything, everything. Every time I punch up the Internet, I'm reading about AI stuff right now. So let me read this. AI has the potential to transform companies and make them more efficient, innovative, and competitive. However, companies need to invest in the right AI technologies, train their employees to work with AI, and address potential ethical and social implications associated with the use of AI. Now, I didn't write that. Chat GPT wrote that in about two seconds. All I did was type in the question, how will AI change companies? So let me go to Bob. There's some fears. We've heard about the fears of AI, but how do you see AI and other technologies playing a part in the new Henry Ford Hospital? I think that AI, as I mentioned before, is going to increasingly have a value proposition that allows the accumulation of data at levels that the human couldn't possibly be able to do and then synthesize that data into you know, the few points that the human on the other end of that needs to consider in medical practice. Um, having said that, I think that we need to recognize that this is uncharted territory and I think there's a few things we need to guard against. One, we need to guard against a different form of dumbing down of, uh, of America, to use uh, that phrase, because we have to have muscle memory that comes from solving problems. And the more we rely on technology to solve the problems, I think the greater risk we have in terms of our um, uh, ability to stretch ourselves. And I think AI needs to be a great supplement to that, but not a replacement of. And I think we've got to be really purposeful about that. I think that that's part of why I think an ethics uh, person needs to help uh, be involved. I think there's going to need to be some regulatory uh, uh, climate, and I'm not a pro-regulation kind of person by nature, but there is going to need to be regulatory space. Cybersecurity becomes incredibly important because you can be manipulated and actually have AI that could do an whole lot of damage. Um, and so I think there's things that we have to do, but ultimately we have to make sure that as the roles of humans are transitioning, that they are still building and using critical thinking skills because critical thinking skills are really, really important. And I just use a silly example, but you know, you wanna see someone that no longer knows how to parallel park and used to be able to do it well, 
have someone push the button and have the car do it for them for six months. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's just a great example of how quickly we lose our muscle memory on something when we're relying on something of an automated source to deliver. So you think about that and take it to medicine or things where the stakes are so much higher. We got to make sure that we're interweaving critical thinking skills and that roles are still challenging to the individual in terms of understanding this work. Ray, how is uh, you and your team thinking about AI uh, for Lear? Well, you know, it, it's, it, it's interesting. There's, there, it seems like every decade there's something, if it's not the PC or the electric motor or, or you know, the internet. And, you know, and these things, you know, even though at first seem, you know, there's a lot of challenges and there's a lot of pros and cons. And you're right, reg regulatory and, and, and us just being smart about how we use this technology <coughs> and innovation is going to go along with it. There will be complete failures. I mean, I think we all know there's going to be issues that are going to create problems. Um, but the way we're looking at it is a continuation of technology innovation that helps us move in the right direction. You know, data analytics, when we talk about, we, we supply safety products every single day. If we can be better at supplying quality products that are, that are driven around safety features, then good. And that's how we're looking at it. Is where can we use that technology that can really differentiate us in a way that helps people that are driving vehicles every single day on the roads. And Tarek, then how should higher ed go about educating students on the use of AI as part of any career they choose? Sure. So I think there are two pieces to this. One of them is the hardcore skills uh, in needed in order to develop the AI system and the autonomous and the automated systems within the various disciplines. And for, of course, you know, we are blessed in a place like Lawrence Technological University because we've embraced that approach of theory, practice, interdisciplinarity, and te technological education in all the fields uh, from our inception 90 years ago. So we're in a good place. But the piece that, uh, that my colleagues piece spoke about, the regulatory piece, the safety, the security, uh, in higher education, the place for that, meaning the kind of discussions about the usage of AI versus developing it, the place for that is what we call in our higher education institutions uh, the, the core curriculum or the liberal arc, arts curriculum that all students have to take across all the disciplines where issues like ethics and technology, ethics and computing, ethics and the usage of AI, were topics like sustainability and making sure that the system we build are sustainable for humanity's use over a long period of time, where the critical thinking skills and the regulatory requirements to make sure that we don't have killer robots roaming our neighborhood every single day. I'm, I'm, I'm not completely kidding, actually. <laughs> Uh, uh, is, is important in, in so many different ways. And I think there is a place for that. And that's, for example, what we are trying to do on Laura's set. What we're trying to do is to use the core curriculum, which is a significant portion of any undergraduate degree in every university in the country, about maybe 15 to 20, 25%, be a place where these issues are discussed uh, in a con concise and comprehensive manner. Thanks. So mine were softball questions. Let's get Angie back up here. She's going to put you on the hot seats. But while she's coming up, I want to say you guys were fascinating, gave us a lot to think about. How about a round of applause for these guys? Thank you. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Good job. Take it away, Angie. Well, we've had a lot of great questions come in. So thank you all for your questions. And many from the students out there, I can tell. Um, so. I know we'll get some good answers here. Um, so we'll start with this one. If each of you could tell us what frightens you and excites you the most about the shift from human power to machine power. I can start by saying what excites me is it's going to allow precision in the delivery of care especially in things like surgical procedures that are very complex, very difficult, and using robotic-assisted uh, measures so that we continue as an industry to focus on reliability and to focus on consistency and safety. That's what excites me. Um, you know, what, what worries me are the things that I mentioned before 
And the other thing that worries me is this time, since we're at the Detroit Economic Club, this time where we will be all investing in all of the AI and digital tools, but not in a position for a period of time to actually redesign work so that we're not also relying on individuals. And that's always a, a very you know, tough overlay. And the economics of that are very, very difficult, um, particularly in an industry like healthcare where your expense of people is about 55% of your total expense. In many industries, it's 15, 20%, the rest is product. In healthcare, it's people. So, so that overlay from an economic standpoint is something that worries me. I think what, what excites me is what I talked about earlier is just the fact that we're gonna be more accurate and the precision um, accuracy on quality and safety. And I do think that can help um, save lives. You know, what, scares me is, is this mean the Terminator's coming? I mean, what's gonna happen? <laughs> it's like, uh, like you said, I what's know. gonna, you know, it's uh, where can this go? There will be failures along the way. There's no question. I mean, you can just look at history when we you know, start to embrace new technologies and there's, there's bad behavior and those bad behaviors lead to terrible outcomes. And so, you know, the outcome of what could potentially happen is, is what uh, terrifies me. I, I, I think we're getting two or three steps closer to to more or less solving the grand challenges facing humanity, you know, with techniques like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and, and deep learning and such. Whether these grand challenges are in the areas of reverse engineering the brain, or genetics, or clean water, or, you know, stopping nuclear terror via predictive analysis. So with all of the amazing technology going on, and again, AI and, 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 and machine and deep learning, et cetera, we're going to be more concise, more precise, more comprehensive, more efficient, and do things well, both within the service and uh, other types of industries. Uh, so as a technologist, you know, I, I am immensely happy, and I think I'm very, very optimistic, obviously, especially given the nature of my, of my university. Uh, what scares me are the killer robots. I mean, seriously, that's, that's and, I, and I mean that, right? I mean, I'm, I'm looking at my colleagues and you have to understand, in universities like ours, uh, you know, we get lots of funding from our defense uh, colleagues, right, and, 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 and industry. And I'm looking at some of the work happening right now uh, within that particular industry, which is incredibly important for our country. And some of the work done here, and frankly everywhere around the world, not only in the US, uh, in terms of coupling autonomy with deadly power is, is actually kind of a little bit scary. And that's why regulation and law and ethics and all of these, regulation in particular, has to be taken incredibly seriously within that particular business. All right, so, so I'm sure this is from our students, but um, I know many people also have um, you know, children and others they're giving advice to right now. Um, just given everything we've talked about with technology, if you're not sure what career to go into right now, what courses do you think would be most useful to take or skills to develop right now to prepare for the next five, 10 years? I think you're going into technology no matter what field you choose with rare exceptions. So I think that students need to understand that Technology is a significant part of almost any professional role today. So uh, don't think about IT as a narrow compartment and say, oh, I don't like that or I do like that. Recognize that information technology and understanding analytics and all of that is gonna be key to every single professional role you go into in one way or another. So that's one piece of you know advice I would give. and. You know, second would be don't short shrift the importance of, you know, what some might call the liberal arts courses, but the things that create, you know, your growth and development as a human and your ability to understand and embrace diversity to explore things in life that are very different than perhaps what you've been exposed to to date. Because at the end of the day, you know, you're going to be working uh, in situations that require you to call upon and really embrace all sorts of divergent thoughts, minds, et cetera. And you know, I, I worry if you jump too much into a technical field and deny yourself that education, it's gonna come back to limit you. 
Yeah, I, I just, uh, um, we talked a little bit upstairs, talking about advice, and you know, you're young. I mean, you got a lot of different opportunities in front of you, and I could give you a lot of different things that I'd recommend, but I'll tell you, I have a great team at Lear, and I'll, what we focus on are individuals that are empathetic, that are passionate, that can work in a team environment, that understand networking, understand how to lean on each other. I mean, those come across different fields, but what you're doing right now as far as challenging yourself, keep doing that. You know, we talked earlier, you will fail. Just keep failing. That's where you learn the most. That's why I know so much. I fail <laughs> over and over and over again. But keep putting yourself out there in different positions that you're not comfortable. Because like we said earlier, those are what really create a resiliency that allow you to keep doing it over and over. So, yeah, you got a bright future ahead of you no matter where, what direction you're going. Uh, I, I heard a colleague of mine on a different presentation a couple of uh, days ago uh, saying classically we asked our you know, uh, children and students what do you want to be when you grow up? And that was a classical question. Uh, and the answer would be an accountant, an engineer, you know, a doctor, X, Y, and Z. Uh, and, I, and I think that's wrong based on my colleague's uh, you know, comment. The, the question is what do you like to do? And what is it that you like to do when you grow up? And what you like to do could be a whole number of things that is not tied to a particular profession or a job title or a degree name. Maybe I like to take care of the environment. Maybe I like to take care of patients. I, I like to be with other people and help them grow. I'd like to teach. And, and, and I think the point that I'm trying to make is whatever it is as a student that you like to do, you should do that, whatever it is. And whether that's in the area of digital of arts or sciences or media or performing arts or music or what have you. But as my colleagues said, be prepared that whatever it is that you like, that you want to do when you grow up, will be amazingly technologically infused. The digital skills required that many of our the younger generation intrinsically are better at than we were when we were their age is gonna be infusing every digital, every field, whether it's in the arts or architecture or music or performing arts or, or even sports. Uh, so the only advice is do what you like to do, what you wanna do when you grow up, keep doing it. Just be prepared to make sure that you understand what digital technological skills can help you make it or do it better and in a more exciting way, that's all. So on that note, so many people are worried about new tech and how it will limit future job opportunities. So what responsibility do you think companies and higher education have in closing that skill gap and maybe um, also you know, what types of internship opportunities or um, entry level opportunities, um, you know, are, maybe you wanna talk about that you're currently offering. I start with you, okay. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> Again, I mean, given the nature of Lawrence Tech, my problem is not to find jobs for my students. My problem is to keep them till they graduate. They get the job offers when they are, you know, sophomores or junior for a full-time employment because of the nature of the skills and the programming. Uh, my problem is to convince the companies that they should not hire them full-time after their first co-op. Uh, and I think, again, answering the question, I think, again, the technological skills coupled with the right education around these technological themes that should be very interdisciplinary in nature, uh, you know, as per the liberal education, uh, ethics, sustainability education, is what will create this wave of professionals who, number one, are very comfortable with change and have no issues whatsoever in getting out from their comfort zone. Uh, I, I am a great example. My area is robotics. I'm a roboticist. Never thought I'd need to learn uh, quantitative physiology or anatomy. But when I started working on prosthesis and, you know, and artificial limbs, I had to learn that. So again, not being afraid to get out of your comfort zone, regardless of your discipline, and make sure you have the technological skills. Universities have to shift, have to pivot, uh, have to think, start thinking about skill, versus degrees and credentials, and also be very comfortable with professional developments and certifications. I would uh, add, uh, and uh, I'm privileged to work with just a phenomenal team of Henry Ford that uh, represent a couple tables here, and we talk about this a lot, and 
we have a list of classifications that we believe will be very minimized in number or perhaps eliminated in the future. And so we develop strategies. What is their current skills? And then what's that gap to get to the next level of skills? And we have you know, internships. We have all the different things that you would see, but we're trying to be very purposeful about making that uh, bridge. And nothing makes us more proud than we see someone that has gone from a housekeeper to become a registered nurse or um, you know, any of our allied health professions. So uh, I think you just have to plan. It's got to be a core part of your strategic planning. And if your human talent transition isn't a part of your core strategic planning, then perhaps that's suggesting that you know, it needs to be. Uh, we do an incredible job um, at Lear about going through training in, in, in different ways, how we train our employees to really uh, get them and, and show them their career advancement. And that, that takes a lot of different um, you know, uh, programs that we run throughout the, the company. But uh, you know, really, in the manufacturing side, like I, I discussed earlier, that's it, more about survival. We, you know, those manufacturing jobs in the manufacturing individuals won't be around. We, we think there's going to be a, a, a serious decline in the manufacturing population for those jobs. So it's that acceleration of bringing in software engineers, robotic engineers, cobots, robots, in, and uh, data analytics to get the facilities to a state where we can actually run the plants. And that's where all the training is going and making sure we understand and have the right resources to really move the company forward for the next five to 10 years. All right. Well, um, this is the tradition of the DEC to end the panel with a lightning round question. So these are some fun questions. Um, so I will ask each of you a couple of these as we close out, but thank you for all your comments. Um, so Tarek, something that's on your bucket list. Oh, uh, well, I, I travel a lot. I mean, mostly on business, but I have a list of 38 countries that I have not visited yet. I visit the remaining 150 or so. So I need to hit them before I hit the front <laughs> before I leave. <laughs> so so um, it's, a, it's an engineering question, you know, question for me. I just need to do this. So. <laughs> um, so for Ray, what, um, what was your first car and did it have a good seat? <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> it was more comfortable than this seat, I can tell you that. Um, I'm not sure we were supplying seats back then, but uh, my first car was a Delta 88, and I, I destroyed that like after a week, so my real first car was a Chevy Nova. Okay. Um, so for Bob, what was the last book that you read? So on the nonfiction side, the last book I read was just last week is called Standing Strong. Uh, overcoming Adv Adversity to Live an Unstoppable Life. It's actually written by Tina Brandau. She worked for me about 20 years ago, and while jogging to prepare for a marathon, had a tree branch come down, caused a very severe closed head injury, but her journey back is nothing short of remarkable. And on the fiction side, I'm a Nelson DeMille freak. I've read every Nelson DeMille book, and uh, I'm now rereading my favorite, which is The Charm School. All right, and uh, we close out uh, with the, um, the lightning round question of what advice to your 25-year-old self um, would you give? Mine's easy, find a way to save your hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just say be patient, be patient. Actually, I was gonna say the same I thing. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I jumped in there. Li li life, life is not a race. In, in my own case, personally, I, I felt I was always in a race to get things done, whatever, like jobs, education, degrees, etc. cetera. Uh, you lose something when you do this, taking your time, really enjoying it, and not obsessing about finishing everything quickly, whatever that everything is, is it's not worth it. Great. Well, thank you all for being such a great panel today. And I'll turn it back over to Steve to close us out. Thank you, Angie. And Ray, Bob, and Tarek, thank you so much for your valuable thought leadership and 
most importantly for enriching all of our communities and supporting the Detroit Economic Club. So a round of applause for these guys, please. Thank you. Thank you. Angie, same to you. Thanks for your time, talent, and all your support of the Detroit Economic Club. Okay, folks, it's graduation time. So if your schedule permits, please network with these terrific graduates as they show off their networking and elevator pitch skills. To the CRA graduates, we're all here to help. We want to give you a hand up to be successful in life. So be confident. Show us what you learned. On time, every time, this meeting of the Detroit Economic Club is now adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Good job, Bob.